This episode of Good Investing Talks is supported by Interactive Brokers. If you're ever looking for a broker, Interactive Brokers is the place to go. I personally use their service because I think they have a great selection of stocks and markets you can access. They have super fair prices and a great tracking system to track your performance. If you want to try out the offer of Interactive Brokers and support my channel, please click on the link below. There you will be directed to Interactive Brokers and can get an idea what they offer for you. I really like their tool and it's a high recommendation by me. And now enjoy the video. Hello audience. Hello Tarek. It's great to have you back Tarek. Uh, we already did an interview a few weeks ago. So for the ones who missed it, you can find it up here and uh, enjoy our first conversation. With the second conversation to understand about you and your mission, Tarek, better, um, we waited a bit because you could release also some um, new news and a new guidance. Um, so let us first take a look at the news and uh, updates you bring with you and then look for the long term. So as I said, guidance, there's also a nice slide in your presentation on mm -hmm. the guidance and um, you modified a bit um, this guidance. I think the new point is this, this break even target you set for 23, 24. Um, maybe let's start with this uh, and walk me a bit through this, uh, how you want to achieve this break even target. Uh, till 23, 24? Um, it is actually not a new target. Um, so first of all, we have published our full year results uh, last Tuesday. Um, today is uh, Wednesday, the 1st of June, um, at the time of the recording. Um, and we have published our full year results. We have a, um, we have a bit of a different uh, fiscal year. Our fiscal year ends end of February. And uh, let, let's maybe like quickly start with this. Um, so how, how was our first uh, fiscal year being public? Um, at least we are very happy. I, th I think also the capital market reacted happily in its own way because we published our results on a, on a day where <laughs> all stocks went down, but our stocks went down less than the ones of our peers. So it's the kind of appreciation that the capital market gives you. So what happened last year? Um, we grew with a uh, we grew our revenue by 48.5%, uh, um, which is great because at the time of the IPO we um, forecasted 40 to 50% growth. Um, so here we ended up at the very top end of the um, forecasted range. Uh, in terms of EBITDA, um, we uh, landed at minus 66 million, uh, which is also better than guided at the time of the IPO. At the time of the IPO, we guided for minus 70. So basically. The top line and bottom line was at the top end and or even um, better than um, guided. Uh, and we have achieved basically or delivered all the things that we promised, i.e. Uh, market entries in Southern Europe, um, fast ramp up, ramp up in Southern and Nordics, etc. And then the next milestone we communicated at the time of the IPO is indeed the break even next fiscal year. So this is not new. Um, it had been already communicated at the time of the IPO and we reiterated on that um, goal of becoming break even next year. And on your question on how to achieve this, um, it's actually pretty simple. Um, in our last fiscal year, um, we have had a lot of market entries. And in our fiscal year presentation, we have actually also outlined how much we have invested in Northern, in Nordics and Southern Europe. It, it, it had been uh, 102 million. So making the math, yeah, last year we were loss making by 66 million. Uh, we invested 102 million in Nordics and Southern. So, you know, all things equal, taking out the new countries that we have started, we would have been profitable. And um, that is actually also one big lever um, towards profitability is actually no market entries because market entries are always a very cost heavy investment. And we are investing in building up brand awareness in the first month, um, not towards um, revenue. So it is quite inefficient in terms of uh, cost revenue relationship. It is quite efficient in terms of brand awareness. So that's a long-term investment. But if we don't do any large scale market entries, we already save a lot of money um, compared to the last years where we always had big market entries. Uh, the second lever is uh, an increased efficiency in, in marketing, uh, which is also just a result actually of having more existing customers and a lesser share of new customers 
within our customer base. And that actually decreases our marketing spend by nature. And the third lever is a co fixed cost degression. Um, so just, you know, scaling and revenue doesn't mean that you're linearly proportionally scaling your costs as well. So there's a degression and those three factors, no market entries, um, uh, higher marketing efficiency due to more existing customers and fixed cost degression, we believe will um, bring us um, above the break even line. Thanks for co correcting my question. Now, maybe it's the focus of the stock market that. No, it, it was it was not totally incorrect. You know, I mean, we gave like a trillion informations at the time of the IPO. Yeah, I believe. I mean, back then it it was more or less a year ago. The capital market also focused on different things. I mean, where we we came from a time where it was all about growth. Yeah, nobody was really looking on things like profitability. So, actually. Um, The focus also from media, from investors, the questions we got were very little around profitability back then, yeah, uh, even though we have communicated it. So it was in the prospectus, etc. So I'm not I'm not surprised that you didn't um, see it because it was not very visible, because it was not very much in the focus. Now, obviously, one year later, the world has changed dramatically. Uh, profitability has become a huge focus for investors. But actually, it's it's actually, I believe it's good because we haven't had to change our strategy. Uh, we could we can stick to our strategy because our strategy already um, incorporated uh, the break-even uh, target next fiscal year. What kind of break-even are we talking about? Is it cash flow break-even or is it EBITDA break-even? Uh... Yeah, it's, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the communication was around EBITDA break-even. Okay. And, and I mean, I also, I think it's important to understand um, – that uh, we are reporting three segments. Um, so our About You commerce business is split into two segments, the DACH region being the German-speaking area, the rest of Europe region being all other countries outside of German-speaking area, and then our B2B segment, tech media and enabling, where we are licensing out our technology and um, selling inventory on our website. So out of the three segments, two are already significantly profitable. The DACH segment has generated 6.6% EBITDA margin, Uh, last fiscal year, it had been profitable throughout the last years. And the TME segment is also significantly profitable um, uh, with, with a profit margin well above 10%. Um, so it is actually just the rest of Europe segment that is heavily loss making. Um, so I don't think that is a that yeah that it's a particularly crazy assumption to, to get to break even next uh, fiscal year. And it's on EBITDA level. But there's also like, if he look again at the guidance you're still guiding for a lot of growth you want to reach the target of five billion in 25 26 um maybe you can walk us through a bit where this growth wants to come from and i also have another chart from the presentation that i found quite interesting this one here where you show this kind of funnel uh of potential future growth maybe can can play us explain us a bit even like from looking at the DAC region where the growth is slowing a bit more um, how you want to grow uh, with the existing customers with the existing, mar existing markets to the reach of 5 billion yeah so indeed our goal is um, to reach 5 billion in net uh, as net revenue in our fiscal year 25 um, 26 so that ends actually it starts 20, 1st of March 2025 and ends um, February 26 Um You said the slowdown of growth in, in DACH. I think there's also another way to look on it. Um, I mean, DACH is already nine years old. Still, we are growing at uh, you know close to 30%. Uh, still, we are outgrowing all our competitors, even though we have significant size. Um, and we are significantly profitable. So I think that shows that the type of business we have built actually is able to organically grow at a high profitability rate, even in a very matured state. Um, if you now take other countries, you know, I mean, look on more or less all other countries. I mean, our oldest non-German speaking countries are Belgium and Netherlands, and we have started them 20, uh, end of 2017. So they're much newer. And then most of the countries we are active in had been started in the last two years. Yeah. Um, so they have a significant growth runway in front of them. And assuming, you know, actually we already see that they are all developing better than Germany. But let's say they are developing equal to the Dach region, so German-speaking area, and German-speaking area is still growing at close to 30% in year nine. I think that really shows how how great the growth runway is. Yeah, And um, obviously, growth per country will slow down every year. 
Um, so we are always starting at, you know, triple digit growth rates, obviously. And then at some point we go, yeah, I don't know, towards the 100%, towards the 50%. And then as in the Dach region, towards the 30, 25 to 30%. But as most of the 26 countries we are active in are so new, they are rather in the, you know, triple digit, high double digit uh, growth state um, still. So there's there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for, for growth. Do you have a rough estimate how many new customers you need to achieve this growth targets and how much growth comes out of the existing cohorts you have? We will go deep into cohorts later, but yeah, uh, maybe you can also give an idea here. Yeah, we are tracking that. Um, I think we have not disclosed it. Um, I mean... One could do the math, uh, I think, out of uh, out of all the data we have published um, and a couple of assumptions. I mean, what you can see is, um, luckily, uh, we have a we have a positive net revenue retention per customer cohort um, that had been published in our um, Q um, four results here. Um, maybe we can also show we can also show that slide. Perfect, that's the slide. Um, so here you can see something very exceptional for an e-commerce business that more or less every cohort is growing every year since ever. Um, and that actually is super unusual because usually you see a decrease um, in cohort spend over years. Yeah, um, That is due to churn uh, because people are churning out. Um, and the remainder uh, is basically having a stable spend and and that leads to a slight decrease in cohorts yeah cohorts basically for for those who are not familiar with the concept of cohorts cohorts basically means you are bundling customers by the year of acquisition so there's a 2017 cohort these are all customers being acquired in 2017 and then you basically follow how have these cohorts developed over time so how much have they spent in 2018 19 and so on and so forth so as said usually it's a decreasing line in our case it's an increasing line why because we are seeing very very little churn i believe that is due to our superior model of inspiration personalization on the smartphone building a huge lock in effect if you have a you know if you have used about you 10 times it really becomes your best friend kind of uh, in terms of recommending you the the, the, the great products you that creates a huge barrier um to to basically churn out our system yeah so we have very little churn um and we have an increasing share of wallet within our customers every year and even on cohorts that are eight years old yeah i mean what what i just said actually even holds true for people we have acquired 2014 yeah um so we have a positive net revenue retention and uh, when we think about growth it comes basically out of two pockets um one pocket is increased revenue retention where actually we are always very conservative because we always believe it might stop. Uh, it had never stopped, but here we have very conservative assumptions on um, increase in cohort performance. Um, so far every year, the reality has beaten our expectation, but that's one pocket of growth. And then the larger pocket of growth is the acquisition of new customers. Um, here we obviously have a number in mind, how much new customers we need every month, year, whatever. We are also tracking this on a yeah, actually daily basis, um, on a country basis, uh, and that then leads to our uh, five uh, five um, billion revenue goal. You mentioned this increasing share of wallets. So, if we talk about like the total wallet of a person in, in an inflationary setup we currently have, maybe you can give me some more details on who are these customers, who are like who is in this cohorts, what kind of target groups are there. Uh, why are they also are willing to spend more on fashion, which might be also a price sensitive topic in the future with inflation coming up? Um, let's start with who's our customer. It's roughly 75 to 80 percent women. Um, and our core core target group is 25 to 35 year olds. And the extended target group is 18 to 39, 18 to 45 maybe. Um, we have customers that are also older. We don't have, theoretically, we have no customers below year 18 because you have to be 18 to order. Some might say that somebody, some customers might lie about their age. We obviously don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the average customers are, is, 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 yeah, and uh, so the median customers end 20 to uh, early 30. Um, 
the increase in net revenue retention, I believe, is not due to the fact that they are spending more for fashion. I mean, maybe they do. I mean, if they start very young, you know, if we win a customer that is 20, then for sure the overall fashion consumption is increasing due to more income. Yeah. But let's take a customer that is early 30, mid 30. I don't think that they are particularly, you know, the, that our increase in their revenue is not driven by them spending so much more on fashion, but it is more our share of wallet, basically our share of the respective fashion spend of that respective customers increasing. And the reason for that is um, that the proposition is just very good. The more you the more you use us, the better the proposition gets. It's one reason. And you, I think the more you use us, the more you think about, like, why do I actually buy anywhere else? And the second reason is our category expansion and our overall assortment expansion. We have expanded our assortment every year, uh, double-digit percentage rate. Uh, we have um, added new categories like um, sports, uh, kits, um, you know, special sizes, uh, premium, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, accessories have, have been, you know, strengthened. Shoes have been strengthened in the past. So actually, we are also covering much more categories that had not been covered in the past. And we are also planning to further grow our assortment. There's a lot of potential to further grow our assortment. And then the third factor is exclusive products. We are having an increasing share of products you can't buy anywhere else. And that also leads to a higher um, share of wallet, yeah. That's interesting. Um, we have some quite interesting trends here. Like you have this growth where you have an idea uh, and good tracking of it, where it should come from and a, a quite strong certainty about the future trajectory of the growth. Um, and we have the stock price that goes down and down and down. And you, as uh, with, your t with your management team, you have to decide where to allocate capital and this kind of setup where does the in which level does the stock price get so attractive that your stock is the most attractive investment about you could do so when do you start thinking strongly about buybacks oh that <clears throat> they are probably the wrong person to ask that would be more a question for my co-founder hannes I personally have never thought about buybacks. That's potentially something he would think about, but I don't know <laughs> whether he thought about it. I don't think so. Um, I mean, you know, we, at least I, um, uh, I, I really try to make sure that we meet our goals and that we create, you know, uh, basically um, ROI positive investments. Yeah. And um, the stock price, um, is something that is very unsatisfying because as mentioned, we have met and or over delivered um, all our goals. And, you know, I always thought <laughs> if you if you deliver on the things you promise and you even over deliver on them. Um, and at the time of the IPO, there's always a bit of skepticism that basically discounts your stock. Yeah, so you earn credibility. And then you over deliver your numbers, then your stock price should go up. And actually, we have done that. Yet our stock price went down by uh, by crazy, more or less, yeah, sixty five percent or something, or sixty percent, I think, uh, versus the issue price, uh, a bit less. That is very unsatisfying. But the stock price of all our competitors globally, except of maybe one, has gone down even more. Yeah, so that show that shows that it's not a it's not an individual problem of our individual performance, but it's a sector problem. And actually, within that global peer group, we are structurally uh, disadvantaged. Yeah, because um, most of our peers are profitable, we are not, and and we know that you know being unprofitable at the moment is not the best um, because it, uh, increased interest rates means you know value in the future is uh, valued less today. So. There we should have citrus paribus. We should have gone down more than our profitable peers, and most of them are profitable already. And the second is uh, the Ukraine war. So we have no exposure to Ukraine and Russia, um, but we are market leader in a lot of neighbor countries of the Ukraine that had been massively affected. So the demand in those countries has massively gone down. Gone down when this war started. Luckily, it had also you know gone up again. 
Mm, but we saw um, um, a significant dip actually um, when the war started. So this is another reason where we should have gone down structurally more. So even though we were structurally disadvantaged by being loss making versus peers profitable, by being more exposed to Eastern European countries than our peers, our stock went down less. So in other words, we outperformed the market even though we went down 60%. Yeah. And I think that shows that we are on the right track. Yeah. Actually, in their very own way, the capital market is appreciating what we are doing. I have to admit, I would have never thought that the macroeconomic um, things have such a strong impact, a much, much stronger impact than your individual performance, because there is no other conclusion. We have delivered everything. We have over-delivered most of the things. We have built credibility. All investors actually tell us we're doing a great job. We've just recently won the prize for having the best IR, yeah. Um, even though we are public for one year. So I think actually we are doing an okay job at least. Yeah, that's what we hear and get from the investor community. And we're asking everyone, like, what can we do? Everyone tells us you are already the poster child uh, of the, you know, 2021 IPO cohort. You are already outperforming your competition. That is actually already a great achievement because you are structurally disadvantaged. But, you know, still, I found it so unsatisfying um, because in my life, um, I always try to make sure that everyone that invests alongside my things or, you know, the things that I do or I'm involved makes money. Yeah? And until the time of the IPO, I've already always, always, always delivered on that. I've built, before about you, I've built B2B businesses. I have, I would say, all of my clients are happy. Yeah? Even if things went wrong, I think we always showed that we did our very best to, you know, save the project and things went wrong very little um, but i mean in agency business sometimes and technology you know sometimes things are delayed but we had a crazily high satisfaction rate every investor that invested with me has made money and now i'm in a situation where a lot of people uh, have lost money theoretically on the paper today hope maybe they have not sold it but on the paper they have lost money and this i find very very unsatisfying yeah and uh, i hope we can change that welcome to the psychopathic uh, world of the stock market yeah. we're meeting mr market right now who's a manic depressive who's doing wild things is not rewarding it it's the feeling that we as mr market loves oil now you know he hates <laughs> tech yeah, yeah it's, mr, it's mr. Like market a, has changed his mind quite quite fast like he loved tech a year ago now he hates tech he hates loss making growing companies he loves oil he loves you know all the shitty stuff in the world uh, that everyone believed you know we left behind us um not all the shitty i mean the you know uh, being profitable and delivering cash you know is a good thing i uh, i personally always um admire companies that for example were built bootstrapped yeah um, instead of you know with high capital intensity so i'm a big fan of i'm not a you know believer of you know let's make losses forever and you know grow <laughs> grow as there's no end you know um, and as mentioned in the face when nobody cared about break even we communicated guys in 23 we are break even yeah uh, and then you know we we always we also communicated you know on the other hand in parallel we look for more pockets of growth you know because I think it always needs to have two both things you know you need to show that you can deliver profits with this business model we are showing this on a country by country basis we say after three to five years a country is break even so the question of break even on a group level is just a result of the age of a country. We have shown this in the Dach region. We have shown this in the rest of Europe. We have actually also published how many countries are already break even. The one that, you know, check kind of when has the country been started? Where is, how is it doing? They see we are always aware, right? So I believe it is super important to show that the business model makes money. And on the other hand, I also believe it, it is important to show where the next pockets of growth are coming from. That's why we have, for example, launched our global shipping platform and have outlined we are already um gathering data in countries beyond europe 
Uh, that's why we have um, uh, started scale on our team e segment. That wh that's why we are um, in constant category expansion. Uh, that's why we have just recently published our um, initiative around the metaverse of starting a marketplace for NFT fashion. That's why we have started our outlet. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, fantasy around where the next pockets of growth are coming from, and at the same time, we want to show that our core is profitable and can be profitable. And all of that had already been communicated at a time where nobody cared about it. And I think that also shows that. This is we are not basically coming up with a new strategy now because the capital market wants to see something else, but we are actually very aligned with what the capital market now also believes, as we believe we need to show profitability in our core, uh, or in our core we already showed, but we need to show profitability basically you know, um, on everything we start after a certain period of time. And I'm strongly convinced that at some point, we have enough credibility that the capital market understands that, you know, this is the way how we do it. We start new things. We invest into new pockets of growth quite heavily in the beginning as for our market entries. And then, you know, we make them profitable after a certain period of time. And in parallel, we start the new things. And you also have this as another de-risking thing, this 500 million euros on the bank. <laughs> It's also not I a bad thing to have at the moment. Yeah. Talk about what what is your plan to do with this relatively big cash position? I think one third of the market cap is currently close, or one close to one third is is cash. Uh, how will this develop over time? So I, I have to admit I don't have the exact number at hand, so I can't um, confirm the five hundred million now. Um, Uh, that again is something that Hannes could, you know, uh, say by heart. But we have a significant cash cash position. That's right. Um, it is, you know, um, first of all, we are burning money this fiscal year. Um, that's for sure. Um, and um, yeah, being EBITDA break even doesn't necessarily mean you're also cash break even. Yeah, but I mean, it means you're at le you're close at least. Yeah, I we have not guided on our cash. I, I don't want to say we won't be cash break even. I'm just saying that's not what we've guided for. We have not given any guidance on cash for the next fiscal year, just for this current fiscal year. Um, um, and, you know, that being said, I, I believe it's um, it's it's uh, wise or it's rational to have cash buffer. Yeah? And um, that's what we have built at the time of the IPO. Every plan we had, you know, ended up with us having cash buffer. Yeah. And also every scenario we calculated uh, for, you know, things can go worth. Uh, in, in some areas, actually, they went worse. Yeah, the pandemic went longer, war, inflation. So things has worsened a lot. So we are happy that we, you know, made scenarios for bad environment. And um, we always ended up with having enough cash on a bank account. I think that's important. And also it gives us flexibility if there, if an opportunity comes across. Yeah. I, I believe it's always good to have, to have a bit of cash at hand to be able to move fast if there's an opportunity. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the rationale behind, uh, us having raised more than we actually need at the time of the IPO. It's also not unusual. Every, um, tech company holds cash buffers. Um, at this point, I want to go back to the charts and cohorts. Um, we already discussed a bit, and I think you, you gave already partly an answer to my question on why the customers spend more and more every year, nearly all the cohorts. But maybe let's do, talk about this again. And I'm also interested in this. I, I went for your shopping process and uh, all, a lot of podcasts listened to. Uh, for the preparation of this. So there's this, this saying that often comes up, retail is detail. And I want you to walk me through a bit for the customer journey and like your love for detail and maybe where you put a lot of focus on details that also allow that these customer cohorts are interested in buying more and more every year. How do you make um, about your great shopping experience so that customers love to buy there and spend more there? Yeah, I think, you know, people um, that look on e-commerce um, and or maybe, you know, I see that a lot on, on corporate groups that um, or offline retailers or catalog uh, players or something that uh, think about um, going online. Yeah? And then they, the first thing, or uh, which they believe will be the kind of main reason for success is building USP. Um, and then they think around what can be our USP and then they put a lot of resources on building that USP. The reality is... Um, in retail, um, no, 
nobody gives you credits for the things everyone expects to be right, but actually these are the hardest thing to manage. So what is this? It is having the products available at the right price, at the right size, um, uh, at the right discounts, voucher levels, yeah, um, which also means no voucher, no discounts at most of the times. Um, a smooth checkout process with all the payment methods available, um, having the ability to choose your um, favorite carrier. It is uh, an immediate confirmation email. It is a track and trace um, that gives you transparency on when the parcel is coming. It is a forecast on your delivery that is actually then also being delivered on that date. Um, it is, you know, uh, communicating transparent and fast when something goes wrong, when something is not in stock. Uh, it is sending the right product to the customer in uh, making sure that the product, even though it might have been returned by another customer before, is in a very good condition. It looks, it had to, it has to look new. It is, you know, if you then return something to um, refund your money as fast as possible uh, to give you transparency where your product is, to give you an answer when you ask a question, ideally via WhatsApp, for example. Um, it is to send you the emails uh, after the order process at the right time. Uh, it is saying sorry if something went wrong. And I could go on for ages where I can guarantee you for, 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 <laughs> for none of these details. things, for none of these things, a customer tells you, wow, I'm so happy about you because, you know, you delivered your parcel on time. It is what the customer expects because the customer expects the Amazon experience in terms of friction-free, frictionless process. But that is much harder to make, you know, to, to deliver than people think, at, especially at scale. You know, I mean, think about it. Sometimes if it rains or the sun comes out, it, this it changes, you know, the number of orders we get on a weekend, you know. And we're talking here about millions of orders, yeah. I mean, we're talking about physics. It's not servers that are scaling. It is people packaging, packing stuff, you know. And you as a customer don't care whether we thought it's raining and then the sun comes out. If you order something on Sunday, you want that stuff delivered on, you know, Monday or Tuesday or whatever, or at least you want to know when it's delivered. Yeah. So you don't care about these problems as a customer. But handling physics creates problems and friction. Handling millions of orders creates friction. Um, handling millions of returns creates friction. So by retailers detail, we mean what we see in our NPS, for example, we ask every customer, how happy have you been after the order? It is the baseline for the customer kind of to get the customer on neutral level is everything goes right. And then you are adding something to make the customer happy and create USP. In our case, it's a great smartphone experience. It's entertainment, shopping, inspirational, entertaining, shopping, and it's personalization. These are our USPs. But in our organization, probably 10% are actually working on these USPs and 90% are working on the all the boring stuff I just mentioned at the beginning. And I believe most companies are actually doing the boring stuff wrong and focus too much on their USPs. Because if you do the boring stuff wrong, nobody cares about your USPs. Actually, people are just looking at your USPs if they are sure that the boring stuff, you know, is managed correctly. And that we mean with retail is detail. Um, having any friction in the process creates massive unhappiness and creates churn. And, um, uh, and, that, and that costs a lot of money. You know, you have usually acquired this customer at a very high price. You don't want that customer to churn out. And, and that's why we are tr always making sure, you know, to eliminate every friction, every incident, um, that might happen along the process. Yeah? And that we track really on a daily basis, on an hourly, actually on a secondly basis, basically, we try to find out are there any frictions in our process. Then let's look at some parts of this, this process or the system you have built. What do you, how do you make sure that you have a great inventory uh, with a great selection at hand? How is this, this inventory process working? So we have three inventory sources um one is the traditional model of wholesale it actually means we have a buying department the buying department goes to a brand let's say i don't know tommy hilfiger and then looks on a collection usually nine months in advance and then says okay i want to have thousands of this t-shirt 500 of that t-shirt yeah and then we are paying tommy hilfiger nine months later we get it delivered it's on our own stock risk it's in our own warehouse on our balance sheet if we don't sell it it's our problem um, and we have full margin. That's the wholesale model. 
Um, and then there's Marketplace and Marketplace um, or 3P um, uh, as it's called in our um, um, uh, yeah, reportings uh, platform. There are a couple of words for that. Uh, 3P is split into two models. Um, there's the direct shipping model where actually the supplier usually um, has an e-com warehouse pushes the product data to our website, says, guys, I have like hundreds of this T-shirt here. We display it. If the customer orders that T-shirt, we route the order to the supplier and the supplier sends it directly to the customer in a, in a about you parcel with a about you delivery um, with a note, etc. So the customer actually doesn't see that it's a, it's coming from the supplier. It feels like a second warehouse. And then there's a, thir a second model within 3P and that is called Fulfillment Buy. Um, and that actually means the supplier is putting stock in our warehouse, but on their stock risk, not on our stock risk. So the supplier is using our fulfillment actually as a service. So they are putting the T-shirt on our in our warehouse. We charge them for um, warehouse space. Um, it's their stock risk. They can you know pull it out whenever they want. They um, and so on and so forth. And if the order comes in, we are doing the fulfillment basically on behalf of our supplier legally it's a bit different i'm kind of explaining the process now not the legal process but like the the, the, the process how that it, how it's working um and 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 then basically yeah we send it to the customer out of our own warehouse even though it was on the stock risk of our um of our supplier in the beginning so these are the three stock sources and with these three three stock sources we try to build a perfect um, assortment. Um, so that means the short tail, where we are sure we're going to sell it. You know, we're going to sell hundreds, thousands of these products. We buy them in wholesale because we know stock risk is no risk. Um, we very well know how much we will sell, and we have full margin on that. Um, on the mid tail, um, this comes also products that want to be pushed by the supplier where maybe we have not the same confidence on the potential of the product as the supplier. The supplier believes, you know, this is going to be great or this is a category I want to invest in. I want to have maximum visibility, maximum uh, customer experience. Then they put these products in our warehouse, but they hold stock risk. And then on the long tail, uh, that is being covered through our um, drop shipping model uh, where the supplier keeps the product in their warehouse and we are just routing the the, the um, the orders through, yeah, and that that is how our, how our um, assortment is built, and you that this works quite well. You can also see in our numbers, you know, roughly twenty five percent of our assortment is actually in our warehouse bought and wholesale, but the twenty five percent are generating roughly seventy five percent of our revenue. So here you see it's the short tail that's turning fast, and then the other way around. It's, these are not the exact numbers now, but like to give you a rough idea, you know, roughly. 75% of our assortment comes uh, is in 3P, either fulfillment by or direct shipping, generating roughly 25% of the revenue. Again, these are not the exact numbers. They are changing uh, seasonally, so, um, uh, but just uh, the, the rough concept of, of, uh, of 1P, 3P. In this 3P system, how do you ensure that the quality stays high? Like, Is there a tight onboarding process for a supplier? Um, and also, do you have then churn? that sometimes it doesn't work that well with yeah suppliers. there's a tight tight onboarding process but more importantly there's a, 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 a rigidious um tracking yeah so uh, we ask for the track and trace data we want to know whether the customer received their parcel when we told the customer that he or she will receive the parcel um we uh, uh we let our partners sign an sla service level agreement on how fast they have to deliver um, how many f mistakes they are allowed to do, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and if they don't deliver on these uh, KPIs, they are being thrown out. How are the supply chain problems we are currently talking a lot about affecting you at the moment, and uh, how much track is this on you? Yeah, we we have moderate supply chain issues, um, but there are ones, at, or there are there are supply chain issues. We have also for the ones that are super interested in that, or maybe we can also show the slide slide fourteen in our full year presentation, um, where we have outlined basically um, how much have we ordered and would have expected to be delivered, and how much has been delivered. Um, so the delivery ratio is being shown actually, and here you see that we are seeing supply chain issues and delayed deliveries 
yet it is not crazily significant and it's actually concentrated on a few categories. So it's especially footwear and sports where we see a significant impact. We see moderate impact on fast fashion apparel kits and accessories. We see low impact on regular apparel, underwear and swimwear. Um, so it is manageable, I would say. Another part of this system we are trying to describe here is your the number of 11.5 million active customers you have. But you also have this 135, 135.7 million user sessions per month. We already talked a bit about the active customers um, and the target groups you're addressing. So maybe let's talk a bit about the relationship with this user sessions. Why are there so many sessions with this only 10, 11 million um, active customers? How are people using your app? How are they interacting with about you? Yeah, the average um, active customer or the average customer is visiting us every second or third day. So we have very high frequency of visits. Um, people are also uh, browsing around. Basically, same reason why you would visit, I don't know, Instagram or TikTok or some kind of stuff. It's, um, you know, in former times, probably people have, you know, read a fashion magazine. Yeah. So it's pretty much, you know, similar usage sometimes um, people Are showing yeah I, i just anecdotally maybe uh, i was uh, sitting in the in, in in the waiting room of uh, uh of uh, of a, a dentist and uh, you know at least in germany uh, you always have these magazines on the table yeah and i, I mean i remember 10 years ago you you know you went to the, to, to the waiting room of a doctor and you found these you know free magazines and then you read the mag everyone was holding a magazine there yeah and um now you can really see a difference. You know, the very old people still grab a magazine. The young people pull out their smartphone. And I saw um, a young lady entering the waiting room. She looked on the magazine table, checked out what magazines are available, sat down, took her smartphone out and opened the about you app and was literally randomly scrolling around. Yeah. So here, I think we had a, You know, we had a perfect um, competitive situation, yeah, because it was a free fashion magazine. Uh, these, these are usually people in fashion magazines there. So it was for free. It was there. It was available. It would have been even faster to grab the magazine. Um, and yet she took, she preferred uh, About You. And, you know, if even in that situation people prefer About You, in a normal situation where the fashion magazine would need to be bought, costs money. You know, obviously, I think there's even more reasons to use about you when you're bored and you want to get entertained in the fashion context. And that is actually, um, yeah, what, one reason for, for our very high user and visit frequency, which is a very good thing because we um, keep being top of mind um, for our community because they're using us on such a regular basis. Yeah. And then another reason for high sessions is, um, is the market entries. In the faces of the market entries, it's um, for us, it's not so much about converting the customer directly. In the beginning, you've already mentioned this funnel. So we are very much in the beginning of a country launch. We are not so much around, we need to acquire as many customers as possible. We are much more around, we need to fill the funnel as, uh, we, we need to pack the funnel as much as possible because we know if someone is now a funnel, the, the user will convert at some point. Yeah, And for us, it's always the best if the user checks out our website, even if they don't buy anything. But the chance of them buying something six months, 12 months, maybe two years later is very high if they have uh, visited our website once. Yeah, And that's why we, we always try to fill the funnel with people being aware of our brand, considering our brand, visiting our website, um, because they will convert at some point. And, and that, that leads to a lot of, uh, uh, that leads to high sessions, um in in uh, in in phases with uh where countries are quite new so maybe then explain a bit how you're filling this funnel what is the the things you do to fill the funnel yeah it is it is mostly you know marketing campaigns and marketing stunts so when we are launching a new country we always shut down our website before so the website is usually already online for like six months or so 
call it the soft launch phase, where we are optimizing all the processes, etc., making sure everything runs smoothly. Then we are shutting down our website for one week. And this, in this week, we are doing teaser campaigns. Um, and on the website, there's just a countdown, not more, and you can in insert your email address. And then we are doing a teaser campaign, not not mentioning who we are. We're just saying um, the, na the neighbors will talk about you and then about you as a logo fund, or the campus will be curious about you, or um, the Amsterdam will go crazy about you and then always communicate the starting date, the 10th of October or whatever. Uh, so we create a huge cu curiosity for one week. And then on the day of our launch, the date we have communicated, we are releasing who we are, i.e. the most inspiring person fashion online shop in Europe. And then we are doing four weeks of crazy marketing, all kinds of events, uh, uh, marketing campaigns, social media stunts, and so on and so forth. But it's all not around, you know, buy fashionette about you. It's more really about get inspired, visit us, explore, um, you know, um, be free, express yourself with fashion. It's brand communication. Um, and that creates a lot of awareness and a lot of people actually visiting our website and just check it out. Yeah. And this is how we are actually filling the funnel. We try to make sure that people are brand aware and, um, uh, yeah, then because we know that if they know us already in a positive context, performance marketing will make sure that we convert them at some point in the next two years. And what is the result? The result is on this slide 10. Um, you have shown. Um, so uh, here we are outlining um, the uh, Nordics and Southern Europe um, with a total population of roughly 200 million people. Uh, out of these 200 million, roughly 80 million are in our core target group and uh, roughly 20 million are aware of us. Just 1.6 million have already bought at About You. Or, I mean, 1.6 is actually quite, quite a large number, I would say, um, after you know a couple of months. Um, but that also means, you know, out of the people that know us, um, you know, 18.4 million have not bought at about you yet. Uh, and even 8 million are already saying in market research, I consider about you. Yeah, so they are pretty close to buying. Uh, so this is huge potential um, to convert in the next, uh, you know, years to come. With the data from DACH, uh, to which level could you bring? Uh this 1.6 million uh, roughly i mean we have countries where we have a, a penetration of 50 percent already uh, uh, this is not the dach region now um because uh, we have a higher penetration we have higher penetration rates in in, in some countries outside of the dach region uh, but the penetration rate within our target group i believe can you know yeah can 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 go can, can go up to 50 percent actually Uh, at least, you know, I'm not sure about the penetration rate of, of Zalando, but at the end of the day, you know, I always say, if someone asks me who's our, who's our target group, you know, literally, theoretically, it's everyone that's not running around naked. You know, how many people do you know that are running around naked? I don't know a lot. So actually everyone can be our customer. Also people that are outside of our age core age group. Within our age group, you know, I loved I love our business model for, you know, for that. You know, literally everyone can be our customer. And I mean, how often do you have a business model where literally everyone will find something also i mean we have customers that are 60 years old and we know that's not a fake age we know that they're real age you know they also find stuff on about you because also age doesn't play such a big role anymore so actually saying that out of the 200 million population just 80 million our, our core target group it's kind of a market research thing you know i actually believe our target group is 200 million, yeah? But okay, let's say it's the 80 million, and then from that 80 million, our theoretical reachable penetration should be 100%. Uh, because why should anybody buy anywhere else? We have every brand. We have, uh, so we have every style, we have every brand, we have every size, you know, plenty. The, the, we have a smooth delivery. We It is hassle-free, it is free shipping, you know, you can pay on invoice. You can return within 100 days. So if you are, you know, stupid and lazy, you know, you have 99 days to decide whether you want to keep that or not and then, you know, send it back for free if not paid any money. I mean, what speaks against us, yeah, is the question. And uh, we have a lot of products you don't find anywhere else which are very cool and compelling. So I would say, you know, the goal should be 100% penetration rate. Obviously, that's a theoretical goal. You never reach that. Um, but I don't know a reason why we shouldn't, you know, try to get as close to the hundred percent as possible. And as mentioned, we have countries where we are already at 50% penetration rate. Yeah. 50% of the broader target group, uh, 16 to 49. In this case, Or female. Yeah. Um, yeah. so women, uh, 16 to 49, 
in um, can there are countries where we have a penetration rate of 50 percent yeah to access these these customers what role do influencers play for you a uh, big role um, it's a big part of our marketing strategy um, working together with influencers we actually um, started that quite early when the word influencers didn't even exist um, because we found out that the number one question under instagram posts and facebook posts back then for the very old people who still remember facebook um, so the number one question below posts was usually where did you get this dress from or what kind of dress is it it's and so on and so forth so in the very beginning actually influencer marketing for us started as a service because we told the people with a lot of followers yeah with no word for it we told them hey guys look um we have a cool idea for you um you can order for free at about you and uh then uh every time someone asks you know where's this product from you can always answer it's from about you because everything i wear is from about you yeah so that's actually pretty cool in the beginning because the influencer was like wow cool i can order for free we were like yeah and and you know the Uh, followers of this, these influencers knew everything they wear from about you. So this is how it started, actually, 2014. Very quickly, we found out this is an amazing marketing channel and, you know, structured it. So by structured it, I mean, we built a tool, we crawled all social media channels, we are looking for new influencers on a daily basis with, a, with technology um, and uh, we're filling out a database with new influencers, new and upcoming influencers, And we are doing more than 2,500 corporations by now every month uh, with influencers across 26 countries. Uh, besides influencers, walk me also a bit through your marketing system and how you make customer acquisition very efficient and like what other partners you're using at customers. Yeah, so the over, maybe start with the marketing steering. So how, how do we think about kind of where to spend money? Um, so in the, in the first year of a country, it's really all about filling the funnel. Um, but afterwards, it is performance marketing. And it is steered on the question on how much does a customer cost us? And how, how much is the um, customer lifetime value over period X? And then the question is really kind of, On an acquired customer, how long does it take to become break even with that customer? And what is the ROI after, let's say, two years, three years, four years, and so on and so forth? So actually, um, this is how we steer um, the question on where to spend the next euro. Um, what and, and in reality, it actually says, okay, we have a let, we have a channel. Let's take I don't know, Google AdWords, yeah, Google Ads. Um, we know there's a keyword. Let's say dresses. Uh, and we know, you know, the next euro we spent there because we always think on a marginal level and the last euro and the next euro we try to calculate. So the next euro we spent, we know we're going to acquire a customer. That customer costs us, I don't know, 30 euro. And um, that customer will most likely have, I don't know, 12 euro or let's say 10 euro profit per transaction. So that means in a f after the acquisition, obviously the customer had, has, has had one transaction we are down at 20 euro. Yeah. So 30 euro acquisition, 10 euro first transaction. And that in other words means we need an additional two transactions until we hit break even. And then we try to prognose, okay, how, how long will this take, you know, including churn uh, profitability, uh, probability. And then let's say the result is 14 months. Yeah. Um, And then the question is, and that is always a the question we, you know, ask ourselves on a daily basis, what is our investment horizon? You know, is 14 months still okay or not? And um, we also try to calculate what is the ROI after two years, three years, four years, you know, and then we know maybe, okay, after two years, we are, we have a positive uh, profit contribution uh, deducting the acquisition costs and reactivation costs of, let's say, plus six euro. Yeah. So then you can, Calculate six euro divided by 30 euro. This was your initial um, custom acquisition cost and divided by the time. And then you actually end up at an IRR. It's very much what an investor would do as well. You know, it is calculating basically the return on investment in period in time period X um, for an additional euro spent. And ultimately, we think about IRR. We think about what is our target um, return um, that we're looking for on the money we spend. Yeah. And that is also, that is being steered on a country by country basis. So in new countries, we obviously have a 
larger investment horizon. We are saying, okay, we want to invest more in grabbing market share. So in new countries, as it's also about kind of land grabbing, basically, um, in new countries, the break-even period is longer and the IRR expectation is lower. And the more mature the country gets, the IRR expectation increases because we want to increase profitability on that country. So this is basically how we steer. And then really the job of our performance marketing team is to find channels to spend money efficiently. Yeah, It's very much, we are very much thinking like a PE or VC or investor or whatever, you know, where do we find, you know, they would say assets, we say customers that are, that have a positive ROI yeah? and, 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 and above target IRR basically. Yeah, and and there we actually test uh, test everything every day, uh, and question everything every day um, uh, to, to to find uh, to find new sources. So it's not like Tarek is waking up uh, one morning and saying, "Oh, we have to do more marketing." It's a clear system you have in place there. Yeah, it is very less cool than people think. It is actually not Tarek sitting in front of an apple tree waiting until the apple falls down and then says influencer marketing. It's like with my great visionary mind, I realized influencer marketing is the thing. It is not like that. It is really us <laughs> testing out every kind of stuff we find. Then looking at Tarek, looking at Excels the whole night, <laughs> trying to see patterns and then trying to find things, you know, that have a positive ROI and can be scaled. Yeah. And then usually it's ex post rationalization where you tell a great fancy story around <laughs> the things you do. But the reality is really it's test and learn and analyze and scale. And uh, that's what we do on a daily basis. Yeah. And then post rationalize and put it into a nice story that you can tell. Um, uh, but the reality is uh, in our marketing, I would say we have like uh, maybe let's say 20% people I would consider as creative and, uh, you know, 80% that are, you know, either project manager executing stuff or the majority is actually data people looking in Excels, not at Apple trees. You call yourself a fashion platform. Um, in this this element of your business or your business model you describe as a fashion platform where does your business get better every day like where's your mode expanding in this sense so is there a certain flywheel you're, you're kicking uh, with more data for instance yeah i think so um so the personalization gets better every day because it's technologically optimized and we have more data that's for sure uh, entertainment inspiration i also hope gets better because we learn how how things are working. Uh, we are also extending our assortment. The larger we get, obviously, the more access we have to uh, brands. The larger we get, the more exclusive products we can launch. Um, the larger we get, the more clients we win in our for our technology solution uh, scale. Um, so there are a lot of advantages in, in being large. Um, we also get better conditions. Obviously, the larger you are, you're, the better your negotiation position gets. Uh, to your suppliers so um, you, you become more profitable uh, we also see the larger you are the the more likely it is that people recommend you because rec people uh, tend to recommend household brands uh, i.e brands that everyone knows you know uh, it's easier to recommend a brand where i don't need to explain you what they are actually doing so if you ask me you know where can i buy fashion i tell you about you um, it is better to, to i mean it's easier to recommend about you if I can assume you already know about you, then if you ask me, where can I buy fashion and say, yeah, look, there's this new fashion platform. It's called about you. You know, they are selling fashion. It's very personalized. It makes the recommendation very tough. Yeah. So the higher brand awareness is the easier the recommendation gets and uh, the more viral you, you go basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, to be also fully honest, I mean, there's no, there are not these networking effects like a social network, yeah, which I believe is actually good because that's also the reason why it is not a, oh, I mean, I'm not sure whether it's good, but I mean, for a fact, it's, this business model has less networking effect. Um, that's also why we believe it's not going to be a monopolistic market uh, like uh, a search or social network uh, where the network effects is, are so strong that nobody else can actually exist. But it, uh, on the other hand, we also um, see huge advantages of being scaled up. Um, so we also don't believe that it will be 
it will remain as fragmented as it is today. But we, our hypothesis is that this market will evolve to an oligopoly of, let's say, I don't know, five players, uh, five large scale players making, you know, the majority of the market. Um, because there are scaling advantages, but there are less networking effects than with a social network. And that means fragmented won't work out. Monopole probably won't be possible. So it will be an oligopole. You had this nice chart in your last presentation, not like a recent one, but it gives an idea about the yeah the scaling of uh, profit contributions from uh, new customers. Are the reasons you described just now the same reasons that these these charts look more attractive with your scale, or are, also, are there also other reasons behind this? Yeah, okay. that chart basically shows the development of, um, on the left-hand side, the revenue per population or per, per citizen, basically, and on the right-hand side, the um, margin, uh, the net contribution margin, so after all variable costs, i.e. after marketing, logistics, and so on and so forth. So what you can see here is with every new customer, uh, with every new country cluster, we have scaled the revenue per inhabitant faster. And on the right-hand side, you see we did all of that at a much higher capital efficiency with every new customer uh, country cluster we started. So there are two reasons for that. First reason is our overall platform is getting better and better. So back then, 2014, when we started the DACH region, I mean, we had very little assortment. <laughs> it was all kind of a bit shitty. Um, and now, you know, it is a great product, great assortment, great personalization, great inspiration, great entertainment, great smartphone, and great everything. Great prices, great, great, great overall experience. Yeah, so the platform is getting better and better, and that obviously makes it more efficient to scale, and you can scale faster. The second reason is a competitive reason, um, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. These are the two more recent lines here on that chart. Uh, the chart is already one year old, so at that time we have not been in Southern and Nordics. Um, um, the, um, there was very little competition, yeah. So we could grow very, very fast, probably as fast as Zalando grew in, in you know, a lot of uh, European countries at the time. They, you know, expanded into other countries. The Dach region is the most competitive region in the world, had already been competitive back then in 28. Um Uh, and, you know, now in, in a lot of countries, oh, Dach and, and for, for example, Bena, Belgium and Netherlands is also quite competitive and, 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 and CE had been less competitive. So we managed to grow much faster there, actually. Yeah. And, you know, if we look on Nordics and Southern, they, rain, they, they, they are also around, you know, uh, um, the uh, Belgium, Netherlands line, uh, uh, sometimes a bit better. Um, uh, so this is, uh, this is basically the line for a, uh, Uh, platform is better than a Dach region. Uh, competitive situation is, you know, as it is in, in most matured Western countries. That's interesting. Coming back to the the platform concept, like how do you play the platforms? There are different platform models out there. If you think about Amazon, that also use the data they get <laughs> to push their products and their brands. Um, are you more neutral, like this, like Switzerland? What is what is the way? I should understand the idea of a platform for with about you. Yeah, so we are having own label products with about you label and edited, um, but these are fairly small. Um, and our strategy in own label is more around incubating exclusive brands and collections together with influencers. And there, it's not so much around the question on what worked so we are not copying the best sellers of any brands but it's really more about what does the influencer like yeah um like to wear and we are kind of the individual tailor of the influencer maybe um so we use data for for uh, so we it all starts with the question on what does the influencer want what is the influencer wearing and then obviously we also use data on you know what colors what shapes what sizes what uh, Uh, quantities etc yeah to 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 order to make it right yeah but it our strategy is not around copying our suppliers i think that would be a very stupid strategy um for us it's important and we have basically three mission statements 
Uh, we have one vision statement, becoming the global number one in fashion, online fashion. And then we have three mission statements. First is digitizing the online fashion stroll for the Gen Y and Z. And the second one is creating incremental revenues for our fashion brand partners. So that already shows that we are very much committed to making sure that our partners make money when we make money and not to scam or, you know, to basically try to, I don't know, kill our partners by copying them or something like that. I think that is a very short-term strategy to fuck up your partners. Yeah, um, And I strongly believe, as I have mentioned in, the, in my statement before, I strongly believe in long-term value creation. I strongly believe in reputation. I strongly believe in f finding the right partners and you know making sure you are always working with the best people and the best companies. And that also means, you know, live and let live basically and not you know fuck up your partners by copying whatever they did right um, uh, um, so this would, would never be our strategy because it against, goes against our our basically moral understanding of doing business that's interesting to hear um with moral we are also we also have to think a bit about sustainability because i think uh in the markets you're present you also need to be sustainable to win. Um, how sustainable do you think about fashion at, about you? And like, um, where do you also want to get better? Um, yeah, we, we do think that um, the whole topic around uh, sustainability or ESG, or as the capital market likes to call it, um, is a very important topic. And not because the capital market asks for it. I mean, the capital market asks for it, but We also believe it is really important. Um, it is important because we believe that, you know, companies at a certain size have responsibility. And yeah, I mean, we are all living on one planet and in one society. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good to, to not take the responsibility that you have as a big company yeah, with a big impact. So we are embracing our responsibility. And I also believe that in the long term, companies that really don't care about this topic will have problems. I believe in the beginning, we'll have problems to fight em employees um, and in the second place, customers. Be at the moment, also customers do care about it, but they're actually a bit louder in their voice and the media coverage than probably their customer behavior. Yeah, But also today, you're missing customers if you don't care about the topic. But I think in the future it will be even more. And, but today, for sure, you're missing, you know, young employees because they want to work in an environment where they have the feeling it is um, it is taking care of the or it is embracing the responsibility the respective company has. Um, that being said, what are we doing? Uh, we just recently published our ESG report um, for the ones that are interested on our IR website. You can check it out. And then we have also updated our company presentation. Um, uh, Uh, alongside our um, full year presentation um, and, and there we also have a, a chapter on ESG um, so we have uh, basically three areas of um, activity uh, we call it uh, planned people and progress uh, planet is mainly or I think to highlight maybe three topics around planet that's um, being carbon neutral um, since one and a half years already um, trying to lower the carbon emissions of the um, orders we are of, the, of our operations basically and then um, offsetting uh, the remaining um, carbon footprint that we generate also but also you know decreasing waste uh, um, increasing share of uh, uh, recyclable material and so on and so forth um, second um, area um, within planet is increasing the share of um, sustainably or more sustainably produced products within our uh, revenue mix um, in our last fiscal year 22% of the revenue we have generated was with products that are considered more sustainable and products are considered as more sustainable if they meet um, any of our sustainability criteria that are more or less standardized in the industry yeah? so that that depends on uh, certain certificates uh, you need to um, you need to have and this share is constantly increasing and the third area is um, circularity so pushing secondhand products uh, we are selling secondhand products on our website we have more than 400,000 products And the secondhand area on our website, we are running this as a not-for-profit unit. Uh, we are we are about to introduce a service where, um, with the return process, you can also give back products uh, that are lying around in your wardrobe. We sell them on your behalf. We pass you all your earnings minus the variable costs. Um, so really pushing the topic around circularity uh, with the goal of making sure that the 
um, usage of a product basically is being increased. Um, these are the three topics around planet, then around people, it's around creating transparency um, within our supplier base. It's about gender equality. It's about data standards and so on and so forth. It's about um, diversity and inclusion, obviously. And then in progress, we bundle topics um, around organizational questions on you know progress basically means how can we as a company make sure we create impact and you know push on that topic and that is around you know having ambitious targets um setting standards embrace frameworks track everything having c-level oversight uh, establishing strong partnerships yeah so these are the the areas of of, of activity i mean our uh, esg report has like, i don't know 100 pages or so so there's much more i just try to highlight the most important ones which I consider as the most important. Maybe give me a bit more detail on this the second hand option you're trying to roll out and why is it a non-profit organization or non-profit part of the business? Yeah. So we think about second hand in two ways. First it's about selling second hand products and making sure people understand that uh, as an alternative to new hand or first hand you can also buy second hand. And in our case, actually, secondhand is being sold with free shipping, free returns, um, same payment methods, same delivery speed. So basically the same proposition as in firsthand. And also the secondhand products are quality proven. They are washed. So, it, you know, it really feels like firsthand. And, you know, I try to buy one quarter of my of the things I buy at About You. I try to do and uh, not I try. I actually buy secondhand. Um so here you can really see, I mean, I'm always very happy with the quality um, of the secondhand products. Um, so that is one aspect of circularity. And the second aspect is a lot of people have actually basically dead assets in their wardrobe, kind of, yeah? So products they never wear. And then, you know, what do you do with it? You know, most people don't know what to do with it. You, I mean, it's not cool to throw it away because it doesn't get recycled then. There are they have there have been recycled containers in the past. In most countries, they are now not existing anymore. You can obviously go to go to the flea market, but that's a lot of effort. You can uh, use these uh, secondhand services uh, like Vinted. Uh, that's a big big effort. So most people actually don't know what to do with these clothes, and we want to give them a service. So we say, look, um, buy it about you. In the checkout process, you tick a checkbox saying, I want to give back stuff. And um, then you get two extra bags in your parcel. One is for donations and one is for reselling. Then you can decide, you know, do you want to resell the stuff or do you want to donate that stuff? If you put it in a donation box, we try to donate it. By try, I mean, sometimes you can't even donate stuff, then recycle it at least uh, or, you know, um, liquidate it basically. Um, so we try to, you know, make use of the products uh, in the best way possible, which is the donation usually or the recycling uh, and on the resale back we resell it on your behalf in our second hand section and pass you all the earnings minus the variable costs why are we doing this as a not-for-profit um, uh, service because i believe it's the right thing to do to push that topic and i actually see it as a service um why because let's assume you want to buy your jogging pants and then there are two retailers, you know, one says, both say, look, it costs 50 euro, but we say it costs 50 euro. And by the way, if you wear it and at some point you don't like it anymore, we also take it back. We sell it on your behalf. So basically if you buy it at about you, you, it doesn't lose the value completely. Yeah. And I believe actually that's a pretty strong proposition. Um, because ultimately that's also unfortunately in that market, you know, we are selling to 90%, we are selling the same stuff as our competitor, Com not, not 90, but let's say 50% yeah, overlap with our competition. So we, a lot of times we are in a situation where we are selling the same product at the same price, but about you has this value at service of saying, I take it back. Um, by the way, we are also taking back products that have been, um, bought anywhere else. So Theoretically, you can also buy it anywhere else and then resell it over our platform. But I believe actually customers do um, appreciate that service. And I think a lot of customers will actually buy um, at about you. And the second reason is actually it keeps money within our ecosystem. So if you do the reselling part or over our platform, so you um, send us your Hugo Boss uh, shirt, we resell it for you and we say, look, Tillman, uh, it, 
uh, we have 30 euro um, for you now. Um, and uh, we say, look, we sold it for 40 euro. And then, you know, here's our cost uh, uh, cost base. It costs uh, 9 euro uh, um, logistics and all the kind of stuff, payment and so on and so forth. So there are 31 euro left. We will tell you we can transfer you 31 euro or you can get a, um, a, um, a euro voucher of uh, 35 euro uh, to spend it on about you. I believe a lot of people actually will take the money and immediately spend it on about you again. Yeah. So it basically keeps money in the ecosystem as well. So, and, and that being said, I believe that is one of these beautiful examples where um, ESG goals go hand in hand with things that actually also really make sense for the customer and are positive for our business. If you think about the ecosystem and the ways to monetize it, um, you have this platform and there, if you look at other online uh, e-commerce businesses, there are other options like targeted advertising, uh, more selling of third party uh, stuff. Is there anything you think with further scale, like reaching the 5 billion you have as a target that there might be material streams of interesting revenues that come over time for about mm. you? There are already a couple of, you know, interesting revenue streams that have been developed in the past. So media is one where we are selling our um, part, you know, selling media inventory and advertisement inventory on our website. We are already doing that. Uh, I think last time we reported that segment, it was even more than 2% of our revenue um, uh, of our commerce revenue that we are generating just with uh, marketing. Mm, it is fulfillment services um, as described in the, in, in the beginning of where I described the three um, stock sources. One was fulfillment by about you, where we basically do fulfillment services on behalf of our merchants. So obviously we do a margin on that. Um, uh, at some point, um, it might also make sense to sell data to our suppliers, not customer data, but insights. Insights can be, hey, we know that the color blue uh, will be increasingly interesting next season or yellow will be less interesting because we can find out this data within our um within within the data we we have at hand yeah because we know that there is a certain uh, customer group that actually um is a fashion forward kind of so we know that whatever the certain customer group is doing the majority the masses will do next year yeah we can we already see that in our data so we actually could you know give the fashion industry great insights on what will be trend next year. Uh, and that is in, in, a, in a, you know, 450 billion fashion industry, just Europe and, you know, trillion, multi-trillion dollar industry worldwide. That is a pretty, you know, pretty valuable information to know, uh, you know, what will be trending next year. Um, so this could also be, you know, a revenue stream that we have not even touched today. Um, and then there are also kind of, uh, services for our customers that have not yet been established so we have just recently published that we are um, opening an outlet an online outlet yeah um if you look on the numbers of zalando you know the zalando launch is highly profitable doing i think 11 percent of the overall revenue yeah it's a business model we haven't even started yet uh, it's 11 percent or 12 i don't know it's above 10 percent of their revenue yeah very interesting extra pocket of growth and profits um, uh, and also it makes the liquidation uh, a process a bit more efficient. Yeah, We have not yet started a, um, a curation service um, uh, um, similar to Stitch Fix or Outfittery uh, or Zalando Salon. Um, so also a nice extra value add for, for our customers uh, to make them even happier. And, you know, there are a lot of other fields where we can imagine building up new profit streams within About You equal to this whole, you know, selling inventory on our website, fulfillment thing, and also extra services for our customers um, to generate extra revenue and profit streams. Uh, uh, for example, this outlet idea uh, and and some other things. Yeah. So that there's, uh, we are not close to what, what we imagine About You will be as a business model and ecosystem in a couple of years time. And also great optionality is scale your software and service platform. Maybe let's spend the last minutes on scale. Uh, what is scale? And it, is it a waste product of uh, your fashion activities? Um, so first of all, what is scale? Um, scale is uh, scale.com. Uh, it is written with A-Y <laughs> for about you. Um, scale.com. Um, it is our 
B2B brand, we call it a commerce engine, where we are licensing out our technology as a software, as a service model to third-party brands and retailers. So what does this mean? Um, let's say you are a brand. Let's say you are S. Oliver, a recent win of us, um, one of the largest um, German fashion brands, or Marco Polo, for example. Um, then, obviously, you are running your own online shop. And this online shop needs technology. Um, in the past, um, usually if you were an inter enterprise segment, so you, you, you know, generated more than 50 million revenue or even more than 100 million revenue, as most of our clients do, then you usually went to SAP or Salesforce to get your commerce software. Now, SAP and Salesforce commerce solutions are quite outdated. And uh, we are, or we have built a competition to that uh, with um, scale. Uh, so we are delivering an enterprise technology um, to B2C companies in the e-commerce space, mostly um, fashion and lifestyle brands and retailers. And uh, it's a software as a service model, so it's pretty easy. We maintain it, we further develop it, and, and it's pretty easy for, for the customer to implement and to run their own uh, online shop based on that. It's white label, so the customer ordering on Marco Polo, for example, doesn't see anything about scale or about you or anything. It's a white label, separate instance, um, technology-wise, um, and it's pretty cool. We are already running more than 100 shops um, uh, next to about you on our technology. And in our full-year results for the first time, uh, we have actually outlined how much revenue we are doing with scale, because... So far, scale has always been a subsegment within TME, tech, media, and enabling. Yeah, um, there's also the selling inventory on our website in that. There's also parts of the fulfillment margin we have in there in the overall TME. Um, and there's also scale. And scale is basically this separate external business that we are running. So let's assume about you would go away tomorrow, then scale could still exist. Yeah. Because it's uh, it's a it's a separate business, and for the first time, we have actually disclosed how much revenue and profit we are doing. And in our last fiscal year, so in our last fiscal year, fiscal year twenty one, we have generated sixty six point seven million in revenue, and we grew uh, we grew with ninety percent, and the profitability was outstanding. Um, it had been profitable from day one this business model, and last fiscal year we have generated twenty five million in EBITDA. Um, that means a um, profit margin or EBITDA margin of 38%. Why is this outstanding? Um, for those who are not familiar with tech businesses or software businesses, um, the investors usually, if they want to uh, assess whether a business is good or not um, in a very kind of fast rule of thumb way, they usually speak about the rule of 40. The, the rule of 40 basically um, is pretty simple. It means you're adding the relative growth with the relative profit margin. In our case, the growth last year was 90% um, revenue growth, and our EBITDA margin was um, 38%. Yeah? Um, so you are adding these two numbers, and if the result is above 40, you are a great company. If it's above 100, you are a crazily outstanding company and people throw money at you. Yeah. Um, in our case, let's do the calculation, 90% top-line growth, 38% uh, EBITDA, you know, adding these two numbers comes gets us to 128. Yeah, Above 40, you are considered as a great company. Above 100, you are considered as, what the fuck, I'm going to, you know, chase this company to let, let me invest no matter what in that company. We are at 128. So this is outstanding for a technology business. And it really shows kind of the, the potential we believe uh, scale has as a business. Um because it is highly growing, highly profitable, and uh, it is actually a business with crazy lock-in effect. So if you have a customer that actually uses your technology, we always sign four-year contracts, five-year contracts, and it's very unlikely that even after five years, they change the technology. So technology you usually change after seven years, 10 years, yeah, because it's a very crucial part of your infrastructure. So that means if you have a customer actually and you're generating so-called ARR and your recurring revenue, um, then it's very likely that you'll keep that customer over years. Yeah, that's why it, it's you know, software as a service businesses are considered as the new real estate, basically. So let's take this five years and the potential. And uh, I want to ask, where do you see the potential for scale in five years? You have this guidance of 500, uh, five billion. 
And I, uh, as I looked at scale, I thought about it as a 500 million business in like 2027, 26 around this. Am I wrong with my thinking or I, or am I diverting a lot from your thinking with what do you think for, is the potential for scale? Hey, Tillman here. I'm sure you're curious about the answer to this question. But this answer is exclusive to the members of my community, Good Investing Plus. Good Investing Plus is a place where we help each other to get better as investors day by day. If you are an ambitious, long-term oriented investor that likes to share, please apply for Good Investing Plus. Just go to good-investing.net slash plus. You can also find this link in the show notes. I'm waiting for your application. And without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. You're running a bit out of time, so maybe let me do try to do two quick follow-up questions. In your guidance of the 5 billion uh, for 2027, is there already a, a significant revenue part for TME or do you is it just fashion business? We have not disclosed any breakdown of our revenues uh, of that 5 million target. 5 billion okay. target. Yeah. And uh, about the customers, <laughs> the last slide uh, I have um How can you make sure that like, there's a lot of fashion customers and multi-fashion customers you already have relations with? How do, can you access the market outside of like the fashion ecosystem where you're already embedded? So first of all, it's just a selection of our customers. Um, actually, a lot of customers have been recently won and or have not agreed us disclosing it uh, at that time. Um, towards the capital market and or are still in implementation. So we have a lot more customers than the logos you see here, but actually looking at the logos, these are great. Uh, you know, there are great names on this already. As you can see, um, the two top boxes are fashion D2C. So these are the brands, uh, fashion multi-brands, these are, these are retailers. And then there's multi-category. These guys are selling, you know, a lot of stuff, um, usually mostly not fashion. And then there's lifestyle selling some kind of other things. This can be beauty, home living, furniture, toys, soccer, optician, and so on and so forth. And um, we see actually that uh, obviously in the beginning we have had a lot of inbound leads from the fashion space because they knew us. Um, but we are seeing that actually our win rates in other categories outside of fashion are more or less equally high. The um, lead times are a bit longer. The sales cycles are a bit longer because they don't know us that good. We don't have these good intros and access to C-level as we have with our fashion brands, obviously. Um, but it Uh, we are very successful in selling all of our software to people outside of the fashion space. And this is also where where, where we see a lot of potential to grow. Um, but also in fashion, you know, we are not covering, we're not even covering a friction of the fashion market yet with our software. Yeah, uh, the, the majority is still in the hand of SAP and Salesforce um, being the market leader uh, for, for enterprise shop software. Maybe just a quick answer. So the revenues in scale is licensing, And you also get a certain share of the revenues and the, or the GMB uh, of the shops you, that run on scale? And um, it's just the latter. Um, we are um, charging on a take rate basis um, on the GMV uh, of our customers. Great. So well, if they you. grow, we grow. If they shrink, we shrink. That also explains like that the growth in the last quarter might not be that strong because we had a certain blip in e-commerce that was yes, on. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the deep down in the numbers investor saw that in, in our fiscal Q4, which is December, January, February, we saw a bit less growth in that. And that is also partly because especially Gen Feb, actually more or less every e-commerce player has decreased in revenue, except of us. We have, in, we have grown. In, uh, um, but if, uh, as a, if you're running a take rate business, actually, if your customers are having less revenue, then you also have less revenue. We still grew a lot, yeah, and that, but these were then new customers added. Um, you know, this is an exceptional, exceptional situation. I think in the first half of this um, calendar year 2022, most e-commerce players are actually decreasing. So that's bad for our business. But, you know, I would say in, 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 uh, after, after that, I'm, I'm 100% sure uh, the average customer in the next year will, will always grow. Uh, so um, charging on a take rate basis is a much better business than having a stable license fee uh, in, I would say, 99% of the normal quarters. And this, now we have two unusual quarters with calendar Q1 and Q2 where e-commerce is actually decreasing. Then 
at the end of our interview, I just have to thank you for your time and the great insights into About You. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. And thank you very much for the audience to listen to us till now. Many thanks for having me. It was a pleasure again. As in every video, also here is the disclaimer. You can find the link to the disclaimer below in the show notes. The disclaimer says, always do your own work. What we're doing here is no recommendation and no advice. So please always do your own work. Thank you very much.